members for the Desert and Warriors Coalition, and um, we're really excited to welcome Trace Jones tonight. Um, she's the co-founder of Body Sanctuary up in Springfield, Vermont, which does amazing work um, both in animal rights and LGBTQ activism and beyond. Um, and yeah, she's going to speak to us today. And we're also selling her book, The Oxen at the Intersection, um, which y'all can pick up after the event at the table. Um, and feel free to get more vegan mac and cheese as the as Patrice is talking. We have plenty of it. Um, yeah, thank you for coming. Welcome, Patrice. Thank you so much. And I'm so glad that you said bye, because uh, as usual, I'm about to forget to mention the name of my organization, <laughs> which is really not good for us when we do that. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so I have uh, brochures. Uh, for for you to pick up, and uh, also the, the, the sign up sheet for for our mailing list. My is, um, <clears throat> I'll just say, because before I get into everything else, we're an LGBTQ run farmed animal sanctuary located in Springfield, Vermont. Um, about 500 animals uh, live, not human animals, live at the sanctuary, um, along with a much smaller number of human animals, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, our sanctuary residents range in size from uh, parakeets to emus, quite small egg factory refugees, 3,000 pound sons of dairy cows. Um, and uh, I'd love to tell you um, all about uh, uh, the sanctuary. Uh, and I will tell you some sanctuary stories, but that's not uh, what I was going to talk about today. So I wanted, um, <clears throat> first of all, say thank you for coming out on this uh, day <laughs> where it seems like nature is playing a trick on us <laughs> again. And I noticed also that um, it is. Um, April Fool's Day Eve. <laughs> <laughs> so I was uh, wanting you to think about, I'm asking you, though I'm asking it rhetorically, you don't have to answer, what will you do to celebrate April Fool's Day tomorrow? What kind of fool will you be? Are you willing to be a fool? Maybe a fool for love? You want to fall for a trick so that somebody else can have the fun of playing the trick? Presuming you not her full trick. Maybe you'll play a joke and you'll know that 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 laughter and joking, that's that feels good, right? Wait, am I wrong about that? <laughs> it feels good. Alright, so are you gonna are you gonna are you I mean I wanna know this. I I will ask you again if you can actually tell me what you will do for April Fool's Day. I want you to actually celebrate it. Are you willing to be a fool also in terms of being willing to try something? Even though you might, which I probably will do fall, um, in the attempt. So I, would, that's, I, I actually asked to have the talk scheduled for today, so it would be April Fool's Day Eve. Um, uh, but it turned out that they brought this book that I wrote, so I should mention it because this nice man is selling them. Um, and uh, uh, this, this is the story of uh, an ill-fated campaign to save uh, two cows. It's called Bill and Lou, and I call this book a case study in catastrophe because we did not succeed in an effort to save the lives of two oxen who everybody agreed never meant anybody any harm. And so I was really, really interested in this question of how come we could and how come literally tens of thousands of people around the world could not save two cows that everybody said were innocent of anything. It turned out I needed a whole book to explain the answer to that question. Uh, uh, so uh, about half of this book tells the story of what happened, but the other half 
is an analysis, an analysis that shows us how what looks like a really simple dispute about whether or not a college would kill two cows and seem to be about nothing other than that. Turned out to be all about race. Even though it was mostly white people talking to each other about what to do about two animals. Also all about gender and ability or disability. And so what I hope that I do in this book is show how we can, it's called the oxen at the intersection, because what I'm trying to do is help us, those of us who are activists, we're interested in this whole issue of what they call intersectionality, how different forms of oppression intersect with each other. How can we take that out of the realm of academia, off the college campus, and how can we put that into practice in our activism, in the things that we're trying to do to actually change the world? And this is sort of a case study. I show how we failed to do that, but I also, I hope, give enough ideas so that when you're facing a similar situation, and it doesn't have to be about animal activism, this isn't just for animal activists, uh, then maybe you'll be better able to come up with, uh, with strategies uh, uh, that, that, that succeed. Uh, so uh, I'll be happy, of course, to sign it if anybody wants to, to, to buy one. Um, um, so, so, so it's apt, since we were fools, um, uh, that this book is out on the day before April Fool's Day. But also, um, I want to talk to you a lot about um, Eros. Which is not just about um, sex, but is about the drive, the wish that we all have for connection, uh, for pleasure. That's why I said jokes. So, uh, so, so, April Fool's Day is actually all about Eros. It's all about having a little bit of fun with people that you like, and I hope we'll do that tomorrow. So, oh, and one more holiday I need to mention before we get to the, to the, to the, to the topic. So this is all just still introduction. <laughs> um, did I say you're not happy you're here? <laughs> I can see the snow. Um, uh, it's also Trans Visibility Day today, so I wanted to uh, to, uh, to uh, give a shout out uh, to anybody here uh, who uh, uh, is anywhere on the trans spectrum, uh, whether or not they're interested in being visible. And that reminds me uh, that a big piece of uh, what I'm going to talk about today has to do with diversity, but not diversity in the um, weak, tepid sense that it has come to be used by people uh, when they just want to indicate what Angela Davis said, a certain visual effect, but sincere understanding of diversity. The world, as biologist Jimmy Howland said, <coughs> is not only queer, <coughs> uh, you're coming in right in the middle of a quote. <laughs> Sorry. Slide and I'll start again. So there's this famous biologist, uh, and we're going to get to some of the things uh, that made him say this, but what he said was the world is not only queerer than we suppose, it is queerer than we can suppose. Uh, the diversity uh, that exists uh, within nature and among people uh, is a lot deeper and broader uh, than, than, than even those of us who, who call ourselves uh, uh, embracing diversity uh, 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 often are aware of. Um, and I'm talking about I'm talking about biodiversity. I'm talking about diversity among animals, uh, and then I'm talking about diversity among groups of animals within animals like. Human animals, but even within groups, right? Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that'll 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 be a theme. But I'm also interested, though I'm not sure we'll have time for in tactical diversity. Tactical diversity, by which I mean um, when we are involved in activism, not just sort of doing the same thing over and over again in every single situation, uh, just because that's what we 
know how to do or what it occurs to us to do, but understanding that complex situations will generally require uh, a diversity of tactics, a diversity of people coming at a problem from different angles using different tactics. Make sense? Okay. So the title of this talk, supposedly, uh, it is um, Queering Animal Liberation, right? And you know what that means? I'm so curious to know what you imagined it would mean. For me, it means something different almost every time. I'm going to break that down eventually. Uh, 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 but I think, and I'll tell you what I mean when, when, when I say queering animal liberation. Uh, 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 and it's probably a little broader than you imagine. Let me just have a quick show of hands up. So how many people here uh, would say that they either, like, how many people here are animal advocates or vegan, consider themselves in some way taking some sort of action on behalf of non human animals? Okay, okay, how many people are um, involved in any way uh, in struggles in some sort of struggle for social justice. That's nice to see. Okay. And 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 how about uh, environment environmental? Okay. People are like, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> That's excellent. Okay. Good. All right. So 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 um. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to tell you what I mean by queering animal liberation. And I have to admit that I was changing my mind about what to say up until the last minute just because I, at this point I have so much around this constellation of issues to say uh, that it's really hard for me to like decide which things to, uh, to say. And I think that means that it's time to write another book. Um, uh, so... I am going to tell you what I mean by that, but I think what I want to do first is bring you at least a little ways along to where I am by, by telling you some of the stories of how I got to where I am on this. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. So, 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 um, before we met, before the... Before the event started, I met with some of the people from Vassar Animal Rights Coalition. Rights Coalition. And um, Allie asked me, what was it like to transition from being predominantly a social justice activist to running an animal sanctuary? Because uh, I spent um, uh, the, the preponderance of my adult life, well, even before I was an adult, starting when I was um, 15, uh, uh, was when I started doing gay rights work in the 1970s. Um, and I did anti-racist work. I was I worked at the Center for Anti-Racist Education. I um, coordinated a tenants union, doing things like organizing rent strikes in public housing complexes. Um, did, uh, blah, blah, blah. all the same different things I did. Uh, the co-founder of Vine Sanctuary, Miriam Gems, and I actually met in the context of a disability rights struggle. Um, so, so you said, what was it like to make the transition? But it wasn't on purpose, right? It wasn't on purpose. So, so let me tell you how I ended up running an animal sanctuary. Uh, and then this will actually, and then you get a sense of what, it's, what it is like to sort of see animal work through a social justice lens, huh? Uh, so, so what happened was that Miriam and I moved to uh, the Delmarva Peninsula. That's a little peninsula that has little bits of Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia in it. So Delmarva. Um, uh, and on this peninsula, uh, this is the place where factory farming of chickens was invented and perfected. On this peninsula, they kill and cut up more than a million birds every day. Uh, we didn't know that. We moved there, having seen on the internet that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, area was an agricultural region, and we were all about getting back to the land 
and uh, she was going to, uh, she was a school teacher at that point, uh, so she, she was going to do public school teaching, and, and I was mostly making my living writing and editing. Uh, and so, uh, so, and it was a low income region because that was the only place we could afford. Right? Um, uh, we were actually moving to a house where we have a whole house and a couple few acres of land for about half what we were paying, you know, yeah. rent a place in the city, right? Um, so, 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 we were imagining, you know, fields, agriculture, not little sheds in which tens of thousands of birds are locked up, right? Uh, uh, I was, uh, we were vegetarian uh, in the process of going vegan. I have been vegetarian since I was a teenager. Mary might only been vegetarian since, since moving in with me. Um, and we were in the process of going vegan because we'd been given money to some animal groups and had learned. Um, about dairy and about eggs. Um, and so I was actually in the midst of this anguishing process of not wanting to believe that I've been going along with so much cruelty uh, for so many years, sexist cruelty in particular, uh, for so many years. Um, and then and, 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 and in the process of divesting my diet of that. Uh, but we certainly weren't animal, and, and, and Miriam had been to a few animal rights uh, anti circus protests, I think. Uh, but we weren't, we weren't animal. By any, by any. We were social justice activists who had sympathy for our own rights. Um, and uh, and uh, so we moved to this area, and we're, we're kind of surprised that we were driving past a slaughterhouse on the way to take the dogs to do that. And then, uh, and then very soon after moving, literally so soon that this all happened, this happened on the day that we were driving to start our new checking account. Uh, so we've been there a few weeks. It was early 2000. We celebrated our 15th anniversary this year. Thank you. So 15 years ago, plus it was in uh, it was a snowy day, but it was maybe early February. Mm, driving to start a checking account, and we drive past a chicken in a ditch. And um, and first we're just like, yay, you got away, good for you. And then we're like, huh, there's snow on the ground. We drive by this bird dust. So I stopped the truck that we got brand not new, but we just bought a pickup truck because you have to haul your own trash. Um, I stopped the truck, I looked at her, she looked at me. We never we didn't even say we will turn around. We just looked at each other and then I swung the truck into a U-turn. I had this like feeling in my stomach like, uh-oh, my life is seriously about to go strange. And I don't have time to be here all night to fully describe to you the hilarity of Miriam trying to catch this chicken, right? I mean she's from Pittsburgh, I'm from Baltimore. Um, uh, 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 she, she chases the bird, the bird runs across the street, she chases the bird, 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 finally she tackles the bird and comes up clutching the bird, terrified of the bird, uh, drive back to the house, she stands out in the backyard supervising the bird, uh, while I make some calls and I call around and I'm trying to find a local animal shelter and I finally reach a local animal shelter and I say, hey, I found a chicken by the side of the road, what should I do? The woman on the phone said, have a good dinner. So then I was like, all right. So this bird is our responsibility now, huh? And luckily, we didn't realize, we actually knew of an organization called United Poultry Concerns, uh, but we, we thought they were much further away from us than they were. They, they actually were about an hour and a half away from us. We could have taken the bird down there, but we didn't realize that. We thought they were so far away. So, so, so we blocked off the corner of the garage with baby gates and went to the local farm store to get what we needed. And this bird became our responsibility. And uh, we called her uh, Moselle after my uh, recently departed grandmother, because uh, she um, 
had her eyes, and also um, her, I don't know what you want to call it, her stubborn charm. <laughs> and, um, and there we were. And it was winter, as I said, and we went online and we found out whatever we needed to know. And one of the things that we found out was that uh, if, when the temperature was below a certain level, there would be a risk of frostbite on the waddle and the cone, huh? And so what we do, and the, it was just this one bird in the big drafty garage. So, so what we do, like on nights when the temperature was predicted to go below that level, was we would um, we would put um, um, wood chips in the bathtub and bring her in there, right? Um, because we had dogs, and that was really the only room that had a good door uh, that the dogs could get through. And so you spend some time in the bathroom, right? And it's intimate time. And so I kind of got to know this bird better, right? And I noticed that um, that uh, she really did have a paranormal personality. And also, um, uh, 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 her, the, the bottoms of her feet were like our hands. I don't know if any of you have ever seen a chicken split, but they've got three toes here, but, but they've got like this puffiness here, and the segments, and then the nails. It's just like it's just like a different version of our hand. And of course I knew that what we and birds have a common ancestor, right? Like 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 all animals. I knew that we had a common ancestor. I knew that we had some basic skeletal similarities. I knew that our brains were similar enough that um, uh, we have pretty much the same structure responsible for consciousness. We have the same kind of limbic system responsible for the really basic emotions like fear, etc. I mean, I knew all that in my head. But this, like, was evidence that we were relatives. So you can guess, I kind of liked this bird a lot. And, um, and, uh, and, and, and the thing that really surprised me was that she seemed to like me too. Like, she would follow me around when I would be outside doing things. And if I wasn't outside doing things, she would hang out on the back steps, kind of looking lonely. And this was just so amazing to me because I was like, like I always put bird food in the bird feeders. But I always thought, so I appreciated birds. You know, birds are beautiful, but I just I always thought that birds and people, like, how could you have a, how could you have a relationship? They're just such different. They're so different. So this was like really amazing to me. Um, so, uh, and the next thing that was amazing to me was then one time when she was in the bathtub, she starts making like this cackling noise. This, she makes this cackling noise. And like right away, I'm thinking back to all those cartoons I saw as a child, you know, like with the hands cackle after they lay an egg, right? So I'm like, oh my gosh, she laid an egg. And I'm like, look, mm, no way, okay. And then a couple days later, I heard her make that sound again. And I was like, did she lay an egg? Did she lay an egg? I was running all around, looking under the bushes, trying to see if she laid an egg, because it just seemed so magical to me that a bird could, you know, the whole transubstantiation of sunflower seeds and cracked corn and an egg. I mean, my God. Um, but no way. And then, one morning, uh, she was back out in the, in the, in the garage, and I, I came out to open up, and I heard like these choking sounds coming from inside the coop. Uh, like she was strapped like this. Thing. And I thought, oh my God, like she's sick. And what am I going to do? Like, I'm going to find a vet who would take care of a chicken here in this particular part of the country, right, where they do what they do to the chickens. How am I going to find a vet for this chicken? What if she dies? Luckily, somebody with a little bit more sense than Miriam or I uh, happened to come and visit, took one look at Moselle, and said, um, that's a rooster. <laughs> and what it was was that 
was it was that was that that sound was um, was actually perlo crowing um, uh, uh, when 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 when, when roosters <coughs> are a lot like um, adolescent boys uh, when they're about to uh, like they get this when they reach sexual maturity they get this growth spurt and like they suddenly have really big feet and um, their voices change. Um, and they're trying, and they're trying, and when they're trying, you know, they're reaching for, right? But they can't quite get there yet, and that, that, that was what was happening. Um, so, um, so that was pretty interesting. But here's what was, was, was a little bit alarming. My feelings changed. Rooster. I mean, we all know what roosters are like, right? I mean, roosters are arrogant. Roosters are cocky. Roosters strut around, want your rule to roost, right? Roosters are aggressive. But this bird wasn't like that. This was my sweet little moselle. And I had to work really hard. Sweet little moselle who seemed a little bit confused. About why I was a little bit more distant for a day or two. And so I had to work really hard not to let the stereotypes interfere with how I saw this bird. I, I, I had this really clear sensation that I was looking at the bird through stereotype colored glasses. You see what I'm saying? And I had to sort of like take them off or, 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 or something. I can't follow the metaphor of the glasses for too long. Um, but I, I had to do something to clear those, metaphor, those stereotypes away from my eyes and see this particular bird as someone who was not particularly any of the things that they call roosters. This was really interesting to me. Not just interesting, but upsetting to me because I don't like being tricked by stereotypes. I like being tricked by April Fool's jokes, but I do not like being tricked by stereotypes. I, and I certainly don't like stereotypes getting in the way of my relationships. So I was actually mad um, about this, and that made me really think about it. And I was really thinking about it. I was really thinking, where did I get this idea? Where did I get this idea that roosters are like this and like that and the other? I told you I'm from Baltimore City. Right? No chickens there. And it's not like my grandmother sat me down at the dining room table and said, now let me tell you, roosters are this way, but hens are like this, right? I mean, it's certainly possible that, that children in more rural circumstances would have their parents teach them about chickens, but no one taught me anything about chickens, and yet I had this very clear idea in my head about roosters being this, that, or the other, and I'll bet many of you did too. Where did I get that? Children's cartoons. Children's books. Movies. This got me thinking a lot about the ways that we use animals in the process of the social construction of gender. The social construction of gender is the process by which people as a group decide, okay, we're going to attribute these features to maleness and these features to females. We're going to call this feminine, we're going to call that masculine, right? And gender systems only work, certainly binary gender system only works, if people believe that this is natural. Something more natural than animals. Right? There's this deep association between naturalness and animals, right? So basically what, what's going on here, and if you think about it, you, uh, unless you've only been exposed to the most recent children's literature, uh, if you think about it, you know I'm, true, I'm right, that we, uh, that our media for children depicts animals in highly gender stereotype ways. It's not just roosters and hens. Depicts animals in highly gender stereotype ways. Just depicts the heroic male uh, or the aggressive male, the nurturing mother hen, yes, the docile female, the flirtatious female, yes, and 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 those 
pieces of children's literature are teaching us something really important, uh, 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 although wrong. And they're, they're teaching us to perceive the world uh, in this gender binary, and they're teaching us that these ideas about which personality characteristics go with which are natural. We use animals to socially construct gender, and it's not just in media. We do things to animals that trick them into uh, acting out gender stereotypes. Cockfighting is a perfect example of that, the strong association between roosters and masculinity in many cultures dating back 3,000 years. Um, it's not only in English that the word cock has two meanings. There's a really strong association between roosters and masculinity. In cockfighting, uh, 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 roosters are essentially tortured and traumatized into acting out our stereotypes of masculinity, which is that males are inherently aggressive, and that you've got to let them fight because that's what men do. And I don't have time to tell you more about cockfighting, but I will say that I'm supposed to promote the sanctuary that because of these thoughts about stereotypes, and gender. Uh, at the time we started the sanctuary, it was believed that fighting roosters uh, were so incorrigibly aggressive that when they were seized by authorities, because cockfighting is mostly illegal, uh, uh, that when they were seized by authorities, they would just have to be killed. Uh, that they couldn't possibly live peacefully uh, uh, with each other or even with other chickens. Uh, and, and, and we decided, uh, on the basis of our experiences with with not only the very first rooster, but lots of roosters we got to know, that we didn't actually believe that stereotype. Um, and that we were willing to test um, uh, uh, it out. Uh, and, and so what we did was we came up with a process for rehabilitating fighting, former fighting roosters, um, giving them the opportunity to learn the social skills um, by which roosters in the wild mediate their disputes. Um, uh, so that they could, and, and also to just um, detox uh, uh, emotionally and physically from the experience of being uh, in cockfights. Uh, 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 and so be able to see other birds without being terrified, because they were fighting from terror, not aggression, actually. Um, uh, and so we became the first sanctuary to rebuild a form of uh, and users, uh, and then we continued to do that. Uh, and we told other sanctuaries about it, and now other sanctuaries say fighting roosters. And there was just now a big bus down in North Carolina, and there's uh, Carolina Waterfowl Rescue. has got 100 birds, and they're not being immediately killed. They're looking everywhere they can to find uh, places for them. So, uh, so, uh, so, so, what am I trying to say here? I'm trying to say here that I started to think about these stereotypes, and that led me to a really interesting no, uh, uh, a recognition that this use of animals in the social construction of gender is something that hurts both animals and people. Hmm? It hurts us by naturalizing the gender binary. And it hurts them through cockfighting and, and many other different ways that animals are forced into living out our ideas about what they are supposed to uh, be. Does that make sense? Okay, so, so, so that was the first uh, bit of, um, of, 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 uh, of knowledge that I gained from the animals of the sanctuary. We grew pretty quickly uh, uh, into, uh, for, uh, into uh, a refuge for, mostly for chickens. Uh, and we're up to uh, between 100 and 200 chickens at, at a time on our, our uh, couple acres of land. Uh, we have a couple buildings. And, um, and then one time, I went away to give some talks somewhere. I was away for a long time. There was a bunch of talks. When I came back, Miriam was late to pick me up from the airport. She said, oh, I'm so sorry. I had a hard time getting the ducks in. And I was like, ducks? <laughs> we get ducks. I don't know if any of you have heard of foie gras. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, you're in New York. Uh, so that's that uh, revolting um, product that is uh, created by force feeding um, ducks and geese until their livers develop a, a, a 
a disease called fatty liver disease. Um, and um, <clears throat> in, uh, in the early 2000s, there was an open rescue uh, at a um, foie gras factory, actually here in New York. Huh? Huh? Correct. Not far from here. Okay. And, uh, and there's a video of that. It's called Delicacy of Despair. Um, and, uh, and you can still see it online. Uh, and uh, at the end of the video, you hear that the birds who, that uh, the people who, an open rescue is when they go in with video, they film, and they carry away any of you who they can openly. Saying that you know this animal will need a better care caring for taking them to do that, mm -hmm. um, and at the end of the film we'll see that the, they say that the birds are now in a safe place. Well, we were the safe place. Uh, we weren't able to say that originally, but we can say that. Um, uh, uh, and and so uh, we got to know ducks, and I don't know how many of you have ever known ducks. Some, some. Yeah, I read some study that says for people that get cartoons, ducks are their favorite animals. Because they're just so. And they are their. I mean, most of the time, cartoons are not right. But I mean, at least the cartoons where they show the ducks by and just being so active and talky and interested in everything, that is ducks. That is ducks. They're so sociable. They're so interested in everybody. And these ducks in particular were particularly gregarious. And we just couldn't. We just loved them so much. I mean, they had been through such trauma. And they were so friendly to all the chickens, and even like kind to the little injured chickens who would come in after falling from the poultry trucks. They even adopted this one uh, little rooster we called him Chumba Wamba, because, uh, you know, that song I get knocked down and get back up again. Yeah? Uh, uh, some of you do. Uh, so he had, when he came to say he had a broken leg, he had a broken wing, he had a broken knee, and he still, like, healed, although he always had a limp. And the ducks just adopted him, so you can see the four ducks, and then the child one little big behind him. It was beautiful. So we were really happy uh, that we would, had gone ahead and expanded. And we had uh, some ducks in one barn and some ducks in the other, because unfortunately we didn't have enough room to have them all together. Uh, but we, we looked at them really carefully. And, and trying to pay attention, like, who was friends with who, you know, before assigning them to the different farms, right? So I was really surprised that when I come out one day, and two of the ducks are fighting. And I'm like, ducks, there is no fighting here. This is a sanctuary. Even the fighting roosters don't fight here. You cannot be fighting at the sanctuary. And as I'm talking to them, I'm figuring out like who's the aggressor and who's be getting the worst of it. And I took the one who was getting the worst of it and, and I carried him into the other one, right? So he'd be safe there from this aggressor. And so I do a few more things. Uh, and uh, I think I cleaned some coops, whatever. About an hour went by. I turn around. And there's the one that I had rescued. And the one, and they're talking, 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 really friendly through a fence that the one who was the victim was like trying to climb to get back over. And that might not sound remarkable to you, but let me tell you, because of where these barns were situated, what he had had to do to get to where I saw him was walk through the, the yard, climb like a six foot fence, walk through a small woods, make a sharp left turn, walk down the road, make another left turn, walk up the driveway, and then climb another fence, which he was in the process of doing uh, when, 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 when I saw him, okay? So I was like, wow, I guess I was wrong. You two really are friends. Maybe you're just having an argument, whatever. I don't need to break up your friendship. Um, fine, I lifted him back over the fence so he could be with his friend, and I went about my business. Hour later, I come out to put down some fresh bedding, and the barn are fighting again. So I take him away, put him in the barn, put down the straw, do a few other things, turn around, and this time he's back again, and this time he's actually making it over that last time. So again, he had walked through the field, Climbed the six foot fence through the woods, 
Left turn, another left turn. Okay. Coming back in. This happened three times before I literally hit my head with my hand and realized that wasn't funny. It was sex. Big boyfriends. And uh, 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 we called them John Paul and Young Cloud. Um, uh, they, uh, they, uh, they, uh, because uh, they, because they both, no, no, it wasn't, it was because they both had, like, they were white ducks and they had, like, they both had these little flat berets. Um, and, 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 and it turned out that they were partners. They were partners for, for life. They turned out to be partners for life. Um, they slept together. Uh, they did things together. I'm not saying they were monogamous. Because, uh, because ducks tend not to be. Um, but, um, but, um, but, but they were together for life. Um, so much so that in 2009, uh, when uh, John Paul finally succumbed to the, the liver disease that's so common among these uh, ducks, uh, 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 a week later, uh, the other, uh, uh, who had been perfectly fine, also died. Um, and I almost broke them up. Right? I almost broke them up. I almost broke them up. Me, somebody who had done all of this queer activism for all of her life, somebody who had even read this book called um, Biological Exuberance. It's this thick. And it, it spells out the, the, the 300 different varieties of non human animals who engage in same sex partnership, sex, courtship, uh, pair bonding, and family raising, right? Uh, did you know that? If you didn't, now you know. More than 300, that's just the documented uh, animals, uh, mostly birds, lots of birds, uh, 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 in, uh, naturally uh, 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 engage in some sort of homosexual uh, uh, behavior. I knew this, and yet, my stereotypes the stereotypes bred into all of us from years of nature programs that portray non-human animals as if they were reproducing automatons whose every behavior is determined by the desire to get their genes into the next generation. Right? That was that had influenced me so much that when that, that it took me three times. Uh, to recognize sex as sex rather than fighting, and to not split up uh, these very devoted ducks. Um, so that got me thinking too, obviously, um, about all of the ways that um, uh, 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 speciesism and homophobia or transphobia uh, intersect. Um, if we see animals as these reproducing automatons, huh? Right? They're just programmed by their biology to do whatever they can to mate and reproduce, right? Wouldn't you say that that, that is, that is a, a common theme in many nature programs, right? Well, if, 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 if that's all that animals are, that's pretty robotic, isn't it? And having that view of animals, it makes it a whole lot easier to lock them up in a vivisection lab, right? I mean, what if you have to admit that animals have sex with each other just because they want to? That they form pair bonds that don't have anything to do with raising children? That they adopt children that aren't even theirs? And raise them in same sex pair bonds. Well, if we, well, then we've got to admit, I mean, if they're having sex and there's no reproduction involved, that's got to be for the pleasure, right? And, and, and if we admit that animals are having sex just for pleasure, we kind of admit they have feelings. They're pair bonding for reasons, and it doesn't have anything to do with raising kids. Huh? That suggests that there's some kind of feeling there. Well, then it becomes a lot harder to lock them up in those section labs, or foie gras factories, 
to interfere with their reproduction in the way that every single use of animals interferes with their reproduction. Right? I mean, those of you who are animals, I mean, think about it. No matter what use of animals we're talking about, whether it's zoos, whether it's farms, whether it's circuses, whether it's Sea World, animals, before they get to the being abused as adults part, well, they're brought into the world. How are they brought into the world? Through, the, for, through forced reproduction, right? No captive animal is allowed to opt out of compulsory heterosexuality. Their owners decide who they will mate with, whether they will mate, and who what they will mate with, and then also get to decide what happens to the kids, regardless of what mom thinks. So this is patriarchy as well. And this is an element of every single kind of, of animal abuse, and it goes right to the heart of homophobia. But it, and, and associated reproducentrism. But it hurts, it hurts, it hurts, it hurts people too, right? I mean, those of us who have done any sort of LGBT work are really familiar with the second most common reason people give for hating on queer folks. The first most common one, of course, is God said so. Uh, is what? God said so. And the second is, it's not natural. Right? So when we, when we, when we deny the truly queer diversity of sexual expression in non-human animals, what we're doing is setting the stage to say that homosexuality is an unnatural aberration. And that hurts, <coughs> right? So, so we have another one of these junctures. Make sense? All right. How long have I been talking? Are you bored? No. Um, so, 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 so I'm telling you the story of the century too, I guess. Okay, so, so we were there on the Del Mar Peninsula for, for nine years. Tiny little sanctuary surrounded by factory farms. Hmm? And um, we ran it together for a while. Uh, and we continued to run it together and live together even after we weren't partners. Um, uh, but it was clear once we weren't partners, eventually someone would want to live somewhere else. Um, it was a couple of somebody else. And sure enough, that was Miriam. Uh, so, so, then, so then she moved off site. Uh, to live with her partner, Aaron, uh, and uh, nearby, uh, about an hour away. Um, and then I ran the sanctuary by myself um, for a few years uh, and um, burned out. Uh, and as I was in the process of burning out, our well was in the process of drying out. Uh, and they were in the process, and I was in the process of deciding that the Bible that really wasn't the best place for us to live. Um, <laughs> Uh, it was it was really hard to run a sanctuary there because we weren't near anybody, um, any sources of support, any sources of financial support, any sources of volunteers, um, and um, so we thought long and hard, and uh, we all three decided we wanted to get out of that region, and so what we decided to do was relocate the sanctuary, um, and uh, and uh, 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 we chose Vermont because we always had a wish to expand specifically in the direction of offering refuge to survivors of dairying, uh, which we had also come to see as a particularly horrific um, uh, 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 violation of uh, 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 sexual violation uh, in terms of the forced breeding and taking away. And, um, and we, were really, we really felt like neither feminists nor animal activists paid enough attention to dairy. Uh, so, and, and we wanted anything that we did to be really grounded in what actually goes on. Uh, so, so we chose Vermont because it's dairy country, like this, this area here is too. I, mean, I drove past some 
places on the way. Uh, and um, and uh, we moved the sanctuary. Now we're big, but in between there, so, oh, right, so then I took a break. Since I've been running it for myself for a while, uh, Aaron and Miriam decided they'd run it for a while and give me a break, and I went to Minneapolis where I was teaching. And one, one of the classes that I was teaching there was a course called The Cultural Politics of LGBT uh, Politics, I think. That's what it was. And, um, and, and, and what I wanted to do when I wanted to teach this course, what I wanted to do uh, in teaching this course was to make it fully ecological, to take into account the, uh, the, the, the new thinking of what's called queer ecologies. Uh, I really, I wanted, uh, I wanted to do a lot of things. So I started looking for textbooks. Those of you who aren't, I don't know if you know, but it, you have to choose your textbook. If you're going to teach, right? So, so I had a little checklist in my mind of what I needed in a textbook, right? And, then, and what I needed in a textbook was a textbook that at least made some reference to the fact that non-human animals uh, uh, engage in homosexual behavior as well, right? Some reference to that. Or I would settle for some reference to the new evolving thinking on queer and ecology. ecology huh? And I also wanted a textbook that wasn't just U.S.-centered. I wanted a textbook that would really take us through the diversity of human sexual expression, not just across geography, but across time, right? There was no such textbook. There was no such textbook. I looked at every single textbook available for, say, an introductory level or any level, gay, lesbian studies course, and I could find even, I could find none that made any reference whatsoever to the non-human. First of all, and I don't need animals for ecology. No, it's not, not there at all. Second, uh, the ones that were international in scope, this was cursory. Uh, and mostly focused on like people doing US style gay rights activism in other places, as opposed to, say, indigenous ways of thinking about sexual, what we call sexual orientation. Um, uh, and, and, and different forms of activism. So I felt really frustrated, uh, but not, but also really challenged. And so what I did was I spent weeks combing through scholarly journals and some non-scholarly and scholarly books and other publications, and pulling out articles and chapters until I had essentially made a textbook of PDFs. Um, that started with queer animals, ended with queer ecology, and took us on a world tour of queerness through time and space in between. Um, and I want to share with you, although obviously since this was a you know, semester-long course, I can't tell you all the things that we learned, but I want to give you a sense of some of the things that we learned, because they may or may not be things uh, that you have learned. One of the things that came up again and again, my students were, of course, mostly LGBT folks, because that's who are really interested in that course, but not all. Many of them were very active uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the trans movement, in various queer movements, um, and yet we were all, me too, at least once a week, somebody was saying, this blows my mind. My mind is blown. The world really is clearer than we can suppose. And that's one of my, mess, my April Fool's messages to you. Although I can't communicate to you all that we learned in that, I, I want you to understand whatever your particular area of interest is, that what there is to know and the diversity of the people and the diversity, not to mention the diversity of other animals, is mind-blowing. And the richer your appreciation of that, the better you are able to think ecologically, to think about how things are connected, and to come up with ways of doing things that take ecologies and intersections into account. And you also become much less hubristic, because once you've had your mind blown once or twice, uh, then you start to realize something that I do want everybody out to, to, to realize how much you don't know, to be a fool, to realize Oh, I mean, there I was. I've done LGBT activism for decades. 
and I know enough about it that I'm invited to teach a college, you know, a, a university course on it. And still, so much I didn't know. So much that isn't even in uh, not just the dominant story, but the story as told by the LGBT movement. It's much richer than that. Um, so that's in general what things we learn. We did learn about the 300 varieties of animals. But we also learned about diversity among humans. We learned about I'm hoping it's because we have to be somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just pretend that's why, yes. So we learned about the invention of heterosexuality. We learned that heterosexuality was a relatively new invention. Now you may be saying, wait, they have to have had it for a long time or we wouldn't, like, exist. But I don't mean the biological act of heterosexual reproduction. I mean the idea of heterosexual identity. The idea that your sexual orientation is one aspect of your identity and that there's an identity called heterosexual. It was, a, it was invented in Europe in the 1800s. The European way of thinking about humans that makes what is essentially an activity into a noun. That makes, so, 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 and this is where we started to get confusion, you know, when sometimes when, uh, when, uh, when, the, when there's when start to be controversies around gay questions in certain parts of the world, when people will say, well, we don't have homosexuals here. Uh, and, 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 and sometimes that's homophobia, sometimes that's bigotry, but other times it's because they don't think of, of that's not how they categorize people. Yes, there's plenty of people who are engaged in same-sex sexual behavior. They just don't have a category of homosexual. Does it make sense? The vast majority of people in the world who cur certainly historically, but I would argue even now, the vast majority of people in the world who engage in some form of same-sex sexual activity do not think of themselves as gay or lesbian or bi. That's kind of mind-blowing. If you're coming from the perspective of the US-centered LGBT movement that assumes that this is an identity, and, uh, and then fits our movement into identity politics. In the same model as, say, civil rights. And obviously, we feel a lot of benefit to doing that. We've seen some benefit, right? I'm not, I'm not necessarily, I'm not saying that's a bad way of looking at it, just saying it's not the only way of looking at it. Does that make sense? So that's one thing we learned. We learned, and then we started thinking, well, 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 there's all the gay animals, and then there's all the gay people. Oh my gosh, and gender. Right? We also learned that prior to the conquest that brought European style thinking about sex and gender, globalized that along with capitalism, people in the world mated and courted and constructed their families in a blooming diverse dreaming ways. And they constructed their gender systems, if they had a gender system, in a variety of ways. Not just binary, but three gender systems, four gender systems, five gender systems. Systems in which there was a place for just about anybody. And this is why, if, if, if you've got, if you've heard this and you didn't quite understand why it was, it's not just about um, race when some uh, native people uh, here in the States elect not to call themselves LGBT, but call themselves Two-Spirit instead. Um, it's not just about native pride, it's also because this is a different way of thinking about it. And Two-Spirit uh, uh, is, is, is a, it's a, it's a different way of thinking about the whole question. Does that make sense? This is why we also learned that while you know uh, globalization then what else did we talk about? Oh right, so we learned how 
the conquest brought homophobia to the Americas, right? You know that, yes? And, 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 and along with cows and pigs and animal agriculture, which was not practiced by Native Americans, um, along with the two-gender system, along with the economic underpinnings of what would become capitalism, um, all in the course of what can only be called a war on nature. And oh, why wasn't there the conquest? You know, why did these Europeans all come over here anyway? Well, because Europe was deforested and overpopulated. Because of this focus on repressing, everybody's got to be straight and have babies. So they just walk, and nature is just something we use. And animals are just part of that, we just use it. So that whole mindset comes over here, along with the conquest, right? And I would argue, and, and we sort of figured out, that, um, that, um, that's how homophobia leads to global warming. And maybe we can't solve any of those problems without at least keeping the others in mind. So what then do I mean by queering and animal liberation? fronts and this and that. We said liberation rather than rights most of the time. Um, but I argue that more point that we should call ourselves a queer liberation front. Um, and, and I fell out of that thing and nobody would take me serious, but I'm serious. Uh, and eventually, uh, I'm just telling you a little bit now, because at this point, including that Q and LGBTQ and even saying Q has been sort of denatured. Uh, we've lost the queerness of it. I was really serious. I'm a queer. Uh, and so while I'm not going to put down uh, a tendency to just sort of use Q as a catch-all, I want to talk about what does it mean to queer something? What does it mean to queer something? It means, anybody know? What does it mean to queer something? Maybe not straight? Go at it in a sideways way, maybe, maybe take into account spider webs rather than trying to make everything like a pipeline. Am I making any sense here? Maybe being a fool sometimes, for love, getting crushing on all the wrong people. So, so queering, when we started to talk in academia about queering this, that, and the other, what we meant was like to look at it from a different vantage point, to twist it around a bit, to not be so straightforward, to not uh, uh, try to conquest it. Um, and so when I talk about queering animal liberation, what I'm talking about is querying, making all of our movements about relationships, uh, and making all of our relationships be vitalized by queerness. Um, or, see, I'm, these all run into each other. I'm running into liberation. What am I trying to talk about here? I'll just stop with that for querying. So what I'm, what I'm talking about is not if, 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 if I want to liberate animals, then I'm going to understand I can't just liberate animals like that, right? I'm going to have to 
circle around that. I'm going to have to come at that from lots of different angles. Animals, though, what am I talking about? Not just non-human animals. Humans are animals. And so when I'm talking about queering animal religion, I'm not just talking about the many ways we think about what gets called animal rights or animal advocacy. I'm talking about queering everything, including human rights. I like to think of human rights as a subset of animal rights. Right? Because humans are animals, right? So we've got animal, animal rights, and then human rights is a subset of that. And if we think of human rights as a subset of animal rights, then we don't make certain mistakes. If we think of animal, human rights as a subset of animal rights, then we don't make the mistake of thinking, then we understand there's lots of subsets of animal rights, and we won't make the mistake as animal advocates of thinking that animals all want the same things. We'll recognize that animal rights is a really diverse question for animal liberation. What, and that just as humans want different things, maybe, than, uh-oh, that humans maybe want different things than orangutans, right? Some of the things are the same, but some are different. They like fruit a lot more than animals. Um, uh, 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 fishes also want something different. Does that make sense? Um, and then, but what am I talking about liberation? Okay, here's the other thing that John Paul and Mark Claude taught me, and then I'll stop because I think we're running out of time and people are running out of patience. Remember what he had to go through? That was pretty deep, right? Now think about pe people, human people. So, so in lots of places in the world, it's been illegal to engage in same-sex behavior, yes? It still is in some places, right? There's laws against sodomy, or whatever they call it. Sometimes even the death penalty. Did that stop it? Did that stop people getting it on with people of the same sex? Please shake your head no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and there have been laws here in the United States and elsewhere against miscegenation, race mixing. Did that stop it? Okay, so that actually teaches us the same thing that Jean Paul and Jean Claude taught me, which is that arrows is super powerful. Eros is so powerful, our wish to be connected, and not just in getting it on, though that's a part for many of us, but our wish to have meaningful relationships, connections with those we love, that is so powerful that we have plenty of documented instances of people risking death and worse. That's our most important resource as activists. And it's a renewable. If we liberate. So what I'm talking about when I'm talking about queering animal liberation is liberating arrows from all of the socially constructed desires that have got it locked in, right? We live in a world right now that is the end result of that process of colonization that I mentioned. We live in a world right now uh, where for most people, desires have been channeled into very sharply circumscribed groups. And even those who seem to have broken out a little bit because they're gay, still want pretty much the same thing, the wedding. <laughs> the destination <laughs> Right? To me, that is sad. So we live in a world where even queer Eros now has gotten locked in, a lot of it, to an economy of getting and spending, an economy where people spend their lives getting the money to buy relatively illusory pleasures. 
plastic pleasures, pleasures that are much less truly satisfying than genuine connection. And I don't just mean getting it on, I mean genuine connection with friends, genuine connection with comrades, genuine connection with nature, genuine connection with other animals. All of that, you must know, so much more rewarding than the destination way. And so when I talk about queering animal liberation, I talk about liberating all of us from socially constructed desires, including the desire to eat other animals, including the desire to shoot other animals. Is that really what people want? Or is, what they, is it what they've been steered to want, right? It is acculturated. You don't grow up with a taste for double cheeseburgers wrapped in bacon. Advertisers inculcate that in you. And even before that, your parents, who were also inculturated, teach you, right? I talked about animals and humans being animals, and I talked about there being different kinds of animals. One of the beautiful things, there aren't a lot of them, but one of the beautiful things about human animals uh, is something called behavioral plasticity. Why, why is there so much diversity? among people, because people, humans have a remarkable level of plasticity, ability to do things in different ways, right? I mean, think of it. Think of all the different ways that humans have, picked, human animals have constructed their habitats. All of the different things, ways that humans have eaten, clothed themselves, made up games, made up music. We can do things in lot, made families. We can do things in lots of different ways. And so that means that we're not locked in to the way things are now. We really aren't. There's nothing in our genes that makes us eat double hamburgers wrapped in bacon or go to war. There's nothing in our genes that does that. It's just that at this point, our desires have been so seized that most of us just go with the program. I'm talking about the opposite of the program. I'm talking about going with the flow of nature. Because the thing about arrows is that it wants the same thing that nature wants. And that's what I mean then by liberating, queering animal liberation. And if you're interested in joining me in that, then what you can do is do something tomorrow for April Fool's Day. And then I'll stop talking because we're totally out of time, I'm sure. Thank you very much. And there's books if you want them, and I'm here if you want to talk to me personally. Uh, and there's still some more mac and cheese, it looks like. <laughs> uh, copies of the books for sale, $16 for pick up. No, but want to sign up for our editor of Divine Sanctuary email list or the Faster Animal Rights Coalition email list. Or if you're interested in becoming vegan and would like your own personal mentor, um, you can sign up for that too. And then, yeah, definitely take mac and cheese because otherwise we have to carry it. <laughs> Thank you all for coming and being vegan.